Christmas, the season of trees, decorations, and gifts. The season of Christ's birth and the promise of salvation for his people. Since the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah's birth, then the second advent and the return of Christ, his children have been waiting. Waiting on God should not be frustrating or discouraging. Waiting on God should be full of expectation and hope. Let's join Pastor Jeremy for this installment of The Gift is Waiting, Love Delivered. Hey, you know, we're speaking on waiting, right? It's the gift is waiting. And it means the gift is waiting. And so it had to happen to me. So I'm coming home from the island last night, and where Highway 6 intersects, uh, you know, the, the main road, Highway 17, um, there's an on-ramp. And I could tell the, the pickup truck in front of me, he was just going a bit too slow on the ramp. And uh, we pull around, and I can see in my mirror there's a transport truck coming. And I think, okay, come on, go, go. You know, like, we can make this, right? I don't want to get stuck between here and there and center behind a transport truck. And sure enough, guy puts on his right blinker and pulls over in the on-ramp, and I'm behind him, right? And then I'm about to go, and my wife yells at me, no, you know, okay, okay, but it's like, it's like God is not done with me, you know? And I look over, I look over, and in the pickup truck, there, okay, let me, let, me, let me back up. There used to be a lady that came to this church years ago. She's, she's since gone on to be with the Lord, but her name was Glenna. Glenna was a, a professional school bus driver. And I said to her, Glenna, when you drive school bus, like, how do you know that? What do you watch out for? And she said this. She said, just always watch out for an old man in a hat. <laughs> so because I look over in a pickup truck, and guess what it is, right? An old man in a hat. So that's why I never wear a hat when I drive, right? I got <laughs> The old man, I'm not wearing a hat. But you know, I thought, I thought, there you go, God. You know, you're, you're, you're already teaching me to wait. Why do I always have to get behind the person who's driving slow in the fast lane? That's just what happens, right? So, I mean, I mean, in some strange way, life is all about waiting, right? We wait, right? I don't know about you, but I wait for my doctor. I get the very first appointment in the morning. I book it a year ahead for my physical, and I get the very first appointment and I wait. I say to him, John, how, I, I, where were you? Like, like, it's my first appointment in the morning, because I know if I get the second or third, then we're there for half the afternoon. Yeah. But you wait for everything, right? Some of you are waiting for test results. You, sometimes you wait for your kids to grow up, right? Some of you are waiting for your kids to leave home. <laughs> or maybe you're waiting for your spouse to grow up. I don't really know. I mean, but, but we wait, right? I mean, life, life is just Wife is just made up of waiting. And you can't make more time, and you can't make time go faster. And so when we look at this idea of waiting, the Christmas story is all wrapped around waiting for the right time. In fact, in Galatians 4 and 4, we, he, he talks about this when he says, but when the set time had fully come, so at exactly the right time, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law. So there's always a time. And how many of you know that God's time is never your time? Are we, have we got the right audience for that this morning, right? God's time is never your time. Doesn't matter what time you think it is, it's never God's time, right? And you think God would get his act together, right? Just at some point say, okay, good. I tell you what, you want that now? I'll give it to you right now. But no, we got to wait. So there's a story of Christmas, and there's a story of two babies. One of them's name is John the Baptist, and of course the other one is Jesus the Christ. And I don't know if you've ever looked at these two babies, because they were born at exactly the time God wanted them to be born, but talk about strange. So let's look at John the Baptist for a moment, okay? If you don't know who he is, he's the guy that was destined to come just before Christ. So first of all, he was born to really, really old parents. If you've been born to old parents, you know what that's like, right? There's challenges being born to old parents. In fact, he was born to a father who couldn't speak because he was struck deaf, struck dumb by, by an angel because he didn't believe him. And then when this kid grew up, he, he moved out into the desert. Okay? And he ended up wearing clothes of camel hair and a leather belt. And, and he ate wild locusts. That's grasshoppers and wild honey, okay? So real vegan, I mean, right down the line, right? 
Right? I don't know if honey's vegan or not, but, but I mean, so, I mean, so could you imagine if you had that kid? Like you'd think, like, why? He's living in the desert. He looks really weird. Maybe your kid looks weird. Maybe you look weird. I don't know. <laughs> right? He has this strange diet. And you know what? If you, if you were to judge him at some point, I mean, if you were sitting there as his parents and said, what's wrong with my kid? If you judge him before it's time, you'd think he really was strange. But he turns out to be the forerunner, the one who comes right before Jesus preparing the way. Just think of Jesus. So here's, here's a little baby. He's born to a single mother. He's raised by a stepdad. Uh, he was born in a barn. Okay, And the first smell in the nose... Of, of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is like a O, O de cow, <laughs> right? The very first breath he takes, right? That big one that a newborn takes, and there it's O de manure, O de cow, O de, o de barn. Like what a thing for the Son of God, right? And, and his, his mother, you know, has these apparitions of angels showing up, you know, and he disappears for 30 years, he goes somewhere. I don't know. I mean, wait, nobody, the Bible doesn't tell us. He just goes somewhere for 30 years and we have no idea where he is. And then when he emerges, he turns out to be homeless. He's got no place to live. For three and a half years, he wanders around the countryside with 12 real weird guys. Right? Okay, they were fishers. They were tax collectors, which were robbers in those days. You know, one of them was a medicine man. They call him a doctor, but he really was... And I don't mean the native medicine man, I mean that real kooky medicine man, you know? And, and, and you look at him again, and, then, and then, then he dies. He dies this crazy death on a cross. And at, at any time, at any time, if we stop partway through their stories, they would be a disaster. You'd think, what? what's with my kid? What's with the way he looks? What's with what he's eating? What's this being homeless, couch surfing. What's this hanging out with 12 dudes? I mean, maybe in today's world, it's okay to hang out with 12 dudes. But I mean, in those days, hang out with 12 strange guys. And if, and if any time we were to stop and try to assess the success of their lives, we would say they were abject failures. But, but is it not true? I mean, I know it's true of me that our tendency is to judge things before their time. Our tendency is to want, to want an answer now, you know, to, to want to say, I want my kid to be like this now. I want my child to grow up and, and be like this now. I want my spouse or my partner to be like this now. Maybe it's about you. I want me to be like this now. And yet there's a time in the universe that is God's time. And, you know, we say things like, uh, you know, uh, if only he'd grow up. If only they wouldn't do that. If only life wasn't like that. And, and we'd have all these phrases that we use. And we use those phrases. And, and do you not find that when we use those phrases, all they do is make us more frustrated? They just make us more frustrated. You just you know, look and say, well, why can't it be like that? You know? Why can't she change? Right? Why can't, he, why can't he grow up? And we, we use those phrases, and when we use them, they create a great angst within us that things are not the way I want them to be. Right? Maybe you've used it about yourself, because I've used it about myself. You know? Why do I do that? Why can I not stop doing that? What is wrong with me? Why can't I grow up? Why can't I be more mature? So if I threw this question out to you today and I said to you, what are you waiting for? What's the thing that's driving you crazy in your mind and you're waiting for it? Uh, I mean, are, are you waiting for your kid to grow up? Are you waiting for your grandchildren to grow up? Are you waiting for the person you live with to grow up? Are you waiting for the doctor to give you the results? 
Are you waiting for a promotion? Are you waiting for recognition? Are you waiting to be valued? Because we all wait. <clears throat> we all wait, and that, that's the Christmas story. So, so, you know, if you're younger today, maybe you're just simply waiting for Christmas. That's what I'd like to happen. It's just Christmas. Maybe you can't wait for Christmas to be over because maybe it's not the best time in the world for you. But everybody waits. Nobody gets through life without waiting. Turn to somebody and say, everybody waits. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say, I don't like it. <laughs> right? I want it to be over. I want it to be over. Okay, whatever it is. I want it to be different. I don't like this period of my life. I don't like what I'm going through. I don't like that I have to deal with this. But what? Everybody waits. So here, I'm going to put this on the screen. What matters is not that you have to wait, but how you wait and what happens in you while you wait. Okay, let's read it together, right? What matters is not that you have to wait, but how you wait and what happens in you while you wait. Right? Isn't that it? Because I can't do anything about the waiting, okay? I can't make my doctor be faster. I can't make that old man in the hat drive on the on-ramp faster. I can't make the people in my life mature any faster than they're maturing. I simply am absolutely powerless over this idea of waiting. So I'm powerless in the sense that I can't make the waiting go faster, but I'm not powerless in the fact that I can change how I wait and I can change what happens in me while I wait. So here's the question for this morning. Do you wait with worry or do you wait with worship? So you're going to wait. Turn to somebody and say, I got to wait. It's a given. I'm going to wait. So are you going to wait and worry? Or are you going to wait and worship? So what's the difference? Well, worry is all me focused, right? I'm worried about this. I'm worried about what I can control, what I want to happen, what I need, what I deserve. Worry is all about me. And that's the whole, that's everything behind worry has to do with me, 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 me. Worship, on the other hand, doesn't have to do with me, but it has to do with God. What does God want in God's time, in God's focus, in giving myself to God and accepting his timing and resting in his plan, his goodness, his love, and his faith? So even if the people in your life mess you up, you can still choose to wait for whatever's going to happen next, trusting in God, or you can wait worrying about what you can't control or what you can't change. And here's the amazing thing is, you know, when you, when you make some choices, and I'm going to show you hopefully how to do that today, so hang in with me. You know, when, when we shift from worry to worship, what happens inside us is we actually move to living life out of a sense of wonder. Because then you go, I wonder what God is going to do. I wonder how God is going to solve this. I wonder what God has for me next. I wonder that even if I'm going through the darkest time, how God is going to show up and be present within my darkness and bring some light to it. I wonder. And so, so I, I move from this fretting, you know, of, of, of picking my nails and biting my nails and doing whatever you do emotionally when you worry. I shift that. And I shift it to wondering what God is going to do. So there are some ways that you and I can wait that will help us not to worry and begin to worship with wonder. And, and the first one of those is to learn to take 
a longer view of life. So in all fairness to all of us, we live in an immediate world. We want it now, right? It's all instant. It's, it's, you know, if my computer doesn't boot up fast enough, I mean, how many of you are old enough to know the days of dial-up computing? Do you remember dial-up, <laughs> right? You remember you had to log on your computer, go away, make some coffee, have breakfast, come back, you know? Now, when I, when, I, when I take my computer to camp and I log on, I mean, if it doesn't boot up in a flash, what's wrong with this thing? What's going on? Maybe the internet is down. Is that not working? Why is that not booting up, right? And all I want to do is take my laptop to somebody to clean up how it starts because it goes through too many things. And you realize the difference probably can be calculated in nanoseconds, right? If you don't know what a nanosecond is, it's a part of a second, right? And we live in an instant society. So when things come into our life and we're dealing with people and we're dealing with situations that involve people, we can't just clean them up and make them go faster because we can't change time and we can't make more of time. Time just is. So I have to figure out how I cannot get caught in this immediate, this instant society that wants results. Maybe what would help us is if we understood that, that our, the entirety of our life is just a small fraction of what goes on in the universe. I mean, I know if you're like me, you think the world revolves around you. And... Uh, I'm learning much to my horror that it doesn't, but I'm not going down without a fight. <laughs> but you know, we, uh, we tend to focus so much on, on us. And yet, if you look at me, and then you put me in this crowd, I get smaller. And if you put this crowd in the community, we get smaller yet. And if we put this community in a province, then we all get smaller. And if we put the province in a country, we get smaller again. And if we put the country in the world, we get smaller again. And we take all of that and we put it into eternity. The Bible says we're just like grass. So we take everything so seriously, right? I don't know about you, but that I do. Everything is so serious. Every waiting moment. You know, I used to love it. When I was a kid, my mom would try to teach me how to bake. I still can't bake. I can cook. I'm a good cook. But I can't bake. I never learned the art of baking. Primarily because I kept opening the oven door. <laughs> it's not rocket science, hey? Don't open the oven door. But you see, if we could understand that, that, that everything that goes on within our lives is a tiny fraction of what God is working out in his universe. And God's got this, and he's working out an incredible plan. He's working towards something that his word tells us is glorious and wonderful, and, and my momentary trouble is so small compared to that. But you know, we've, we've got these sayings that we do, right? How many of you have used this? I can't take anymore. Have you ever said that to somebody about something? I can't take anymore. And, and there comes a time maybe, you know, if you're in a serious, you know, abuse type situation that you probably should say that earlier. But given the normality of life, we use that term all the time. Or we use the term like, I can't handle anymore. But you, when you realize that they're arbitrary terms, you've chosen that you can't take anymore. You've chosen that you can't handle anymore you're the one that's deciding that I don't want to do this. And how many of you said, I'll never get through this, and yet here you are today, you're in it, or you're going in it, or you're about to go in it, or you're coming out the other side. You're somewhere in that process. And for all the times you said, I can't take any more. I can't do this anymore. This is too much for me. I'm never going to be able to handle it. Well, heck, here you are. Look at you. So who decided? Who decided that you couldn't take any more? See, see, when you take the longer view, you take phrases like, I can't take anymore, and you put them in the bigger picture. You do things like, I mean, years ago, there was one of the coaches of the Wolves came here, Bert Templeton. And, uh, and uh, 
Bert came to me one day and he said to me about something. I don't remember what it was. But he says, you know, he says, I drew a line in the sand. Now, if you don't know what that phrase means, it's just, you know, you're making a marker and that's it. You go across it, you're going to get in trouble and you drew a line, you've, you've, made, a, uh, you've made a decision, that's it. And I said, Bert, why don't you just move the line? <laughs> if it's frustrating, you move the line. I mean, you made the line, you said, that's it, no more, I'm done. Just, just move the line. So he comes back to me a week later, he says to me, that's really funny, you know, he said, I, uh, I just decided that I would move those markers that I had set. And uh, I don't know whether it had to do with the team, I, I really don't remember anymore. But you see, we set these markers, and we say, you know, if they do that, then this is what's going to happen. Right? But who decides that? So sometimes, you know, this waiting for things to happen it just requires us to, to take a longer view, to put more in perspective. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, it's an Old Testament book, uh, verse 3 and 11 says, God has made everything, could you just read the next few words? Beautiful in its time, right? Beautiful in its time. See, see God is making everything beautiful, Right? but not in your time, right? He's making those relationships beautiful. He's working stuff out. He's going to make it beautiful. Maybe not your definition of beautiful, but God's definition of beautiful. And it says that he's doing it when? Beautiful what? In his time, right? He says also, you know, he's put eternity into man, man the human heart. Even so, can't find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. <laughs> right? so even though God has destined us for eternity and he's put eternity in our hearts and which eternity is God himself, we still don't understand what God is doing. So I'm either going to wait with worry, I'm going to fret about, well, God, what are you doing? See, when we worry, we're actually saying, I don't really trust you, God, to work this out. That's what you say. It's not nice to hear that, but it's the truth. That we don't really trust that God will work this out. So then we draw arbitrary lines in the sand. We make arbitrary demarcations. I'm not going to take anymore. I can't take anymore. And, and then all of a sudden, we run into our wall. So, you know, it's a little bit like, I don't know if you were a kid and you grew a garden. How many of you ever grew a garden? But, you know, the interesting thing is when carrots first start to sprout, I remember the first time I was on the farm and that happened and I pulled up a carrot. And you know, when you pull up a carrot, when it's just sprout, it's the tiniest, silliest little thing. You know, because if you pull it up before it's time, you don't get a carrot. My favorite one of those stories is Chinese bamboo plants. You plant the seed of a Chinese bamboo plant and it does squat all for five years. It does absolutely not. You can go back and you can look at that and nothing changes. And you look at it and nothing changes. And you go back five years, you have this bowl with nothing. Five years, you water. Five years, you give it sun. You go every day, you talk to it, you sing over it, you pray over it, you do anything you want to do. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the five years, in six weeks' time, it grows 90 feet. 90 feet. That's 30 feet, five feet up to the top of that dome. Three times higher than this dome. In six weeks. So you see, sometimes you, if you don't know about Chinese plants, you're going to be digging it up all the time, looking to see what's happened to the seed. So you see, we do this with our life, right? This is what we do. You've got to stop pulling stuff up. You got to say, okay, God, you've got this. Take a longer time. So, you know, I go back and I think just the thing probably that is a challenge to many of us in the room is when we look at, we look at our children or our grandchildren and we want to keep pulling them up and looking and seeing, is anything going on? Is anything happening? You know? and, we, and we pull them up before their time instead of leaving them to God and praying and believing and trusting. So sometimes you just have to take a longer view and, and whatever that would mean for you this morning. You know, what markers have you set? What lines have you drawn? You know, 
and somehow say to God, God, give me the ability to take a longer view of this thing. And instead of worrying about it, let me just offer it to you in worship. And then let me gaze out in wonder. I wonder how he's going to turn out. I wonder how she's going to turn out. I wonder what's going to happen in that situation. I wonder what God is going to do. My mom and I were chatting the other week. How many of you know my mom's an awesome lady, right? My mom is just the most amazing lady. She's not here to hear this today. She's, uh, she's in southern Ontario today. She's so awesome, she was going to take a bus. You know, 94 years old, she's going to get on the bus to go to Toronto to go to a wedding. And uh, fortunately, somebody drove her. <laughs> but it was like, Mom, you can't take a bus at 94, you know? But, but that's my mom. But we were chatting the other day, and she said to me, she could never have imagined in, you know, 1976 when she saw me playing in the club that I was playing at in New York that I would be standing doing this here today. There's nothing in her imagination. There was absolutely nothing that she wondered what God was going to do. She wondered how God was going to do it, but she couldn't imagine what God was going to do. Maybe we need to move our life into that sense of wonder by just taking the longer view. Secondly, maybe the next thing you need to come to understand is you just can't do it all. You can't do it all. Turn to somebody and say, yes, I can. (laughs) You can't do it all. So much of the worry and the stress of your life is because you think you can do it all. You know, I mean, it's Christmas season. I'm going to have the perfect house. I'm going to have the perfect gifts. I'm going to have the perfect tree. You know, family's going to be perfect, even though Uncle Harry gets drunk every year, and we know that. But this year, maybe it'll be different, you know? You know, we think we, think we can control everything. But there's a sense of liberation when we realize that you are not God. That God can do it all, but you and I cannot do it all. There's a great freedom in realizing that I can do something. There's something I can do here. There's something that I can influence. There's something I can pour my life into but I can't do it all. And the reason we have to understand that in life is because we need to leave room for God's grace. We need to leave room for God to work. We need to come to understand that I can't do it all, that I cannot save people. Just think of the amount of manipulation that goes on in this room every week trying to get somebody you love to church. You leave little booklets lying around on religious things. You make sure KFM radio is on the radio. You know, every conversation you try to turn it to Jesus. Right? Why don't we just let God do that? Why would we just live in love, respond with grace, and let God do whatever God can do? It doesn't mean you don't invite people. It doesn't mean you don't give them offers, but, but you don't manipulate. You don't strategize because, because we can't save anybody. And I don't know about you, but that's a great pressure off me because now I can wonder how God is going to do it. Now I can wonder because God knows exactly what the people in our lives need. I wonder how God's going to fix that Terrible situation in my office. I wonder how God is going to nurture that person along. You know, when you're in the line of work that our pastors are in and a lot of our caregivers here in church, you know, you get that little, you get a little bit of a, what we call a Messiah complex, you know, that you can fix everything, right? You just come to me and sit with me for an hour and I'll get you fixed. Don't bother because it doesn't work. I'm the worst human mechanic ever going. You'll just keep coming back. I'll keep finding other things that are broken. I'll change the wrong parts. You'll be a mess. Because <laughs> sometimes only God can do what God can do. So, so why would you just decide? You know, there's some things here I can't do. 
I just can't handle all of this stuff. I cannot possibly do everything that I expect of myself or that other people expect of me. But I will do something. Because you see, when we're set free from I can't do it all, we're set free to do something. And the something that you and I can do is we are always free to deliver love. We're always free to deliver love. I mean, let's, let's, let's focus back on the Christmas story for a minute, right? And when you think of the story of Christmas, now I know we've romanticized it and we do the living nativity, December 20th, 24th, 7.30, outside in the grounds of Science North every night. That was a product placement ad in the middle of a sermon. Um, <laughs> You know, we romanticize that, but if you just think about the nativity in real human form, it's the story about a bunch of vulnerable people. Not the least bit was God. I mean, God who takes on human form and is bound by whatever Mary chooses to feed this fetus, however she chooses to nurture this little life within her. And then this little life comes forth and and now this little life is as vulnerable as any newborn baby. I mean, it's God in human flesh. And I mean, my gosh, you know, here's a family that's, that's basically seeking refuge. They're seeking refuge from an oppressive government of of Augustus Caesar who decides because he's a megalomaniac that he wants everybody in his whole realm to be counted so he knows how many people are under his his control. And so they end up doing this four-day journey on foot, you know, and, and, and at one of the most challenging health times in a woman's life back in that era, she's giving birth. In a, in a cave or a barn or some stall somewhere where there's animals. Talk about being vulnerable. Even Mary is vulnerable because the number one reason for death in that area would have been childbirth. And here she is, no mother, no father, no parents, no in-laws, no nothing, just her and a carpenter and a bunch of animals. And then shortly after Jesus is born, he's forced to flee as a refugee into Egypt because somebody's trying to kill him. So he has to leave and he becomes a refugee. And it's a whole story about vulnerable people and how God worked through lives of people to protect what is vulnerable. And if you think of what we need to deliver love, you know, and if that's what we're gonna do at Christmas, can we deliver love to vulnerable people? people who don't get it, people who don't understand it, people who are different than we are, people who are strangers. Listen to what Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says as he instructs us from the Bible. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Okay, in, in the original language, it was foreigners. Make the most of every opportunity that you have with them. And then he says, let your conversation always be full of grace. It just, it just means kindness. Let your, let your conversation be of benefit to others because God's of benefit to us. Seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so you look at saying, I'm free to deliver love to, to people, and welcome strangers, feed the hungry, care for the poor, seek justice, be kind. And listen, let me give you the negative. I'm not trying to fix it. I have to stop trying to fix things, especially people. You can't fix people. We just need to love them where they are, to be kind to them, to give them what they need. Stop trying to control things. You can't control people. They won't let you control them. They won't. I've practiced for years. I know it doesn't work. And the immortal words of Dr. Phil, how's that working for you? Not very well. (laughs) But I keep trying to do it anyways. Duh. (laughs) Stop trying to manipulate things. Just be present. Be present in their lives and, and be Jesus to them. Be kind. Because if the truth is told, everyone is vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. 
We just want to be accepted, want to be loved, we want to be hugged, we want to be told that we're okay, not held up to some other measuring stick that we'll never measure up to. Maybe we want to be like John the Baptist and dress weird and eat funny food. Maybe for a while we need to be like Jesus, homeless, hanging around with some strange dudes. But if we pull the carrot up before it's time, if we make the judgment before it's time, if if we hold everything up before it's ready, we will always, and here's the word, okay, it's the elephant in the room, we'll always be disappointed. We'll always be disappointed. I brought my gift back again today. If you weren't here last week, it was a a box of kisses. (laughs) But I brought my gift back because you see, some people spend their lives waiting. But they don't know what for. They have no idea what they're waiting for. They just know... There's got to be more to life than what there is. Other people, and they're fortunate, they wait. They wait with wonder, wondering, well, what's life going to bring me today? What's God going to do today? The great news is that the object of our anticipation, who we're waiting for, Jesus Christ has come. And the one gift you do not have to wait for is the gift of Jesus. He says, I will wait with you if you ask me to. I will wait with you and I will help you transform your worry into worship and wonder. But like all gifts, it's useless to you until you take it. (laughs) So here I am, I talk today about waiting, I talked about taking a longer view, I talked about you know, not having to do it all, I talked about delivering love. It's all kind of useless unless you take it. And of course, it makes no sense at all unless you take Jesus. So that would be my encouragement to you this Christmas, is to really go through this season with Jesus. Really go through this season with a sense of wonder. And really go through this season worshiping and trusting Jesus. And let's just see if we all can't reduce our worry factor and turn it into worship. Would you pray with me, please? Today, Lord, there's a marvelous gift that you've given us, the gift of the presence of Jesus in our life. Lord, help us to realize that gift today. Help us, Lord, to understand that we don't have to do it all, that life is not the immediate that we want it. Life is hidden in eternity. And that, Lord, all you really ask from us today is to deliver love into our world. To the broken, to the wounded, to the misfits, to the strangers, to the foreigners, to those who need justice. And Lord, sometimes those foreigners seem like they're right in our own houses. Sometimes they're in the places where we work. Sometimes we live with strangers under our roof because we just don't understand each other. Lord, may our gift this Christmas be one where we discover the uniqueness of each other and allow that to blossom and exist while we wait in worship and wonder for what you are going to do with those around us. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. I would love it if you would join me in communion today. If you didn't get your communion packet, it's a small little packet like this. They're up at the end of the aisles. Feel free right now to get up out of your seat and go to the end of aisle and and get one. Those of you at home, we'd love you to join us. Find whatever you can to share in communion.
sometimes when I say to people at home, have a cracker and coffee for communion, it might startle some of you. Because within the tradition that we follow, which you believe is the biblical tradition, uh, this is just simply a piece of bread and some grape juice. And that's all it ever is. Because it's a representation of the body and blood of Christ. So today we wait. Today we wait with tremendous wonder. Would you think of Mary for a moment with me? And would you think of Mary at the cross? Standing at the foot of the cross. And Jesus says a a very interesting thing. He looks at one of his disciples and he says, there's your mother now. And he looks at Mary and he says, there's your son. Because he knew he wasn't going to be around physically anymore to look after her. Of course, Mary's heart was broken watching her son die the death of a criminal. But what if Mary's hope ended there? What if Mary thought this was the end? But you see, I don't believe that Mary thought this was the end. Because I believe that Mary trusted what the angel said to her the day that the angel met her when she was just a young, tiny teenager. The angel said that he would be great and he would be the son of the most high God and that he would rule on David's throne forever and ever. And I believe in her heart, Mary believed that. So that the tragedy of the moment, the challenge of the moment, the difficulty of the moment was not Mary's last judgment on things, but instead she took a longer view. And she trusted. She trusted God. Today, maybe you need to take a longer view and maybe that's what this communion means to you. Because in its its real longest sense, Jesus said, do this until I come again. And we are still waiting for the longer view for Christ to return. So after supper, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he gave thanks and he said, here, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Let's eat together. And this is grape juice. Sometimes taking the longer view means that we'll experience pain. Even though Mary knew the destiny of her baby because in her Magnificat, her song in the Word of God, she's very clear about who this Messiah is. But it doesn't mean she didn't experience pain at what her son went through. It doesn't mean that we take the longer view that suddenly we're devoid of painful stuff in our lives. It just means that we know that on the other side of pain is a purpose that only God understands. So after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Drink you all of it until I come again.